you have it live on youtube yeah see so i have okay this is for tomorrow two boss and so this one yeah that's it that's all
Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon and welcome to Bose Institute. We are about to start the program. So I request you to kindly take your seats. And also, please do the needful to ensure that your phone does not ring in the middle of the program. The 30th of November is a very special day for the entire community of Bose Institute. It is the foundation day of our institute. Also, our founder, the illustrious scientist and polymath, Acharya Jagadish Chandra Bose, was born on this day in 1858. Each year, we celebrate this day with a memorial lecture in the name of the Acharya. Today is the 106th foundation day of this institute and the 164th birth anniversary of Acharya Jagadish Chandra Bose. As per our tradition, we will begin today's program with an invocation that was specially written by Kobi Guru Rabindranath Thakur in 1917 to mark the foundation of this institute. The song will be sang by students of the institute. Oh, 
We will now commence today's main event, which is the 83rd Acharya Jagadish Chandra Bose Memorial Lecture. Today's event will be presided over by the distinguished chemist, eminent scholar, and educationist, Professor Gautam Radhakrishna Desi Raju, honorary professor at the Solid State and Structural Chemistry Unit of Indian Institute of Science. Professor Desi Raju will be joining us online. So can you hear us? Oh, yes. Can you hear me too? Can you hear me? Sir, I don't think we can hear him. Yeah. Sir, could you please say something so we know that we can hear you? Yes, I'm saying something now. Can you hear me? <clears throat> I can hear you. Sir, could you please try again? Yes, please. Can you hear me? So please bear with us. We are trying to uh, solve this. Sir. Hello. And mine is on. Hello. Yes, is mute. Sir, would you please check if your microphone is mute? Or, no, it's it's okay. It's on. If my my microphone is on. And I'm able to hear you pretty good. Sir, I'm, I'm yes. really sorry, sir, but could we ask you to please log off and log in, log back in? Maybe that might take care of the issue. <laughs>
How is it now? How is it now? So, uh, I think we can hear you on the streaming uh, system. So, uh, your audio is probably working all right. There's some problem with our stage. We are trying to fix that. Yeah, yeah, we'll wait. <coughs> can you can you please check once again, sir? Yeah, you want me to log off? No, no, no. We are you're perfectly uh, audible now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, okay. Good. So sorry about the delay. Very good. Very Thank good. you. Right. So the eighty third Acharya J C Bose Memorial Lecture will be delivered by Professor Ashutosh Sharma, Institute Chair Professor at the Department of Chemical Engineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. Sir, may I request you to kindly come up on stage? We extend a very warm welcome to Professor Sharma with a plural bouquet. I now request our director, Professor Udoy Bandupadkai, to kindly come up to the stage. Now I request Professor Sharma and Professor Bondupadhyay to kindly light the ceremonial lamp and commence. Oh, yes. Oh, please do that. Please do that. Now we have your chair secured here. Yeah, we can't do this online, unfortunately. May I now request Professor Udal Bandhupadhyay, Director Bose Institute, to kindly deliver his welcome address and present the director's report. Professor Bandhupadhyay, sir. Good afternoon. Our chief guest, Professor Asuka Sharma, Honorable Chairman, 
Both Institute Council Professor Gautam Desiraju, distinguished guests, ladies, gentlemen, my dear colleagues and scholars. I extremely warmly to get this opportunity to address you all on this auspicious occasion of 106th Foundation Day of our elite institution. On behalf of all my colleagues of this institute, I extend a very warm welcome to you all. Bose Institute had been organizing a memorial lecture in the honor of Acharya J.C. Bose since the year 1938. This kind of celebration is necessary to motivate today's and tomorrow's scientists and students for accomplishing research in multidisciplinary fields seamlessly to honor Acharya Bose, the father of modern Indian science. I'm happy that the 83rd Acharya J.C. Bose Memorial Lecture 2022 will be delivered by Professor Asuka Sarma, Institute Chair Professor, Department of Chemical Engineering, Indian of Technology, Kanpur, on the brave new world of science today is about the world of J.C. Bose and C.V. Raman, coming full circle. Wonderful topics, I think certainly you will enjoy. I'm also grateful to the Honorable Chairman of Bose Institute Council, Professor Gautam R. Desiraju, for giving his kind consent to preside over this prestigious event. He was very keen to attend personally, but because of his health problem, he is keeping his word through online mode. I'm sure you will like and enjoy the program, but therefore, uh, I'm really also uh, wishing that you will also enjoy the whole day. Uh, but before I close, let me share with you overviews of some of the activities of Bose Institute. Bose Institute was founded by Acharya Bose on 30th November 1917 after his retirement from the Presidency College. In the Foundation Day lecture, he mentioned, I dedicate today this institute not merely a laboratory but a temple. Temple of science where science is God to be worshipped through experimentation. In Bengali, I should tell this thing that will create huge impact to all of us. Very nice word he delivered. Bharater Gaurav O Jagoter Kollan Kamanai E Bigyan Mondir Devo Charone Nibedan Kodilam. The objectives were set by Acharya are as follows the advancement of knowledge by means of research, the diffusion of knowledge by organizing discourses, demonstrations, and lectures to be given by original workers, innate and thinkers. To do all such things are as incidental and conducive to the attainment of the above objects or any of them. In a sentence, I'd like to brief it. The fuller investigation, in his word, the fuller investigation of the many ever opening problems of natural sciences, which include both life and non life. It's my pleasure to inform you that finally, we have been able to successfully sit to the unified campus of Bose Institute at Salt Lake on 14th July 2021. I will fail to resist my temptation to inform you that the person who plays the instrumental role in providing fund to Bose Institute was Professor Ashutosh Sharma. He is with us right now. I am extremely happy to have him among us and he will not hesitate to continuously empower Bose Institute in his coming days. I'd like to highlight major areas of focus, which are as follows, which we are actively pursuing right now. High energy physics, understanding of subatomic particles, quantum information communication, understanding the responses of plants under biotic and abiotic stress, system and synthetic biology, environmental microbiology and climate change, structure and function of macromolecules, bioinformatics, bioorganic chemistry for drug development, identification of drug target and validation of bioactive molecules for therapeutic interventions. It's needless to mention you that all the focus areas are closely aligned to different beneficial programs of government of India. Because here we are to empower scientifically government of India to make a robust nation to science. We have achieved a lot but I cannot specifically mention each achievements, but I will mention the field for brief understanding. Microbes and microbiome, the achieved areas, disease and therapeutics and drug target, land development, stress and yield, biological systems and information and network, high energy and nuclear physics, 
physics of materials and quantum systems, climate change, aerosol, and cloud formation. To name a few which has created significant impact, I like to highlight in front of you. Contribution of Bose Institute to air pollution mitigation in West Bengal and the National Clean Air Program, Government of India. Remote operation site for online ships of Alice experience. An interspecific hybridization between cultivated Indian system, S. Indicum and S. Mulayanam to bring a better oil profile to the cultivated system. The planned Jamplasm Registration Committee of Indian Council of Agricultural Research has certified the generation with the registration number and preserved it in their repository on July 8, 2022. Now I'll mention the academic profiling of Bose Institute in, briefly, in a brief way. During the year 2021 and 22, Bose Institute had published 202 numbers of full-length peer-reviewed international research papers in referred journal with an average impact factor close to four. 20 books or book chapters or invited reviews. The institute had produced 15 PhD students, trained 28 research manpower, BTEC, MTEC, MSc, diploma, etc., who are successfully leading their professional lives all over the world. Bose Institute always played pioneering role in catalyzing frontier research with tangible global impact or active involvement in overseeing and designing manufacturing and supply of in-kind items, for instance, power converters, beam stuffer, for accelerated and coordinated participation of Indian scientists in the experimental at facility for anti-proton and ion research at arms at Germany. This is really a significant make in India effort from both institutes. It is also not worthy to mention that these in-kind endeavor is boosting the financial growth of different indigenous organizations, companies, invigorating the financial stability of the country as well as the industry and science and holistically. Different Indian companies are attracted by foreign investors to provide various in-kind items. Asserting various national and global collaborations with both institutes, we may cite Fair Darmstadt Germany, Facility for Antiproton and Ion Research, a large ion collider experiment, Alice, a dedicated heavy ion collision experiment at Large Hadron Collider at CERN, yeah. National Collaboration, National Carbonaceous Aerosol Program, NCAP, National Mission on Strategic Knowledge for Climate Change. Bose Institute has organized not only the seminars and symposiums and deeply involved in main kind preparations, but also actively involved as a part the celebration of 75th year of Indian independence, Azadi Kaumbit Mahotsav, organizing functions, lectures such as Fourth Alice Indian School and Quark Bigom Plasma, lecture on Brownian motion of Corona and Quarks, National Science Day, talk by young researchers of Bose Institute, and a panel discussion on the contribution of women in science, science education, unified campus, Bose Institute's all day, celebrating Rastri Ekta Divas, which was held on October 31st. 2022. We have some deficiencies and some works which require immediate attention. The major works to be completed are renovation of Bose Institute main campus started very soon. This heritage campus is in dilapidated condition. Since it is a heritage campus, heritage architect is employed to prepare a detailed project report for getting funds from infrastructural aid from BST. The financial advisor of DST has already visited the campus and opined for restoration of this heritage campus following proper rules. Building up of a scholar's hostel and guest house. Recruitment of new faculty members completed. And again, you are going to recruit 12 more to empower our strength. I have divulged many things before you. Now time has come what Bose Institute will return for making India a great nation visible internationally in the field of science and technology. The government has provided all kinds of support and assistance for keeping Bose Institute viable, but the contribution from our end is not enough. Despite our systematic endeavors as well as sustained contribution to elevate the research level of the Institute, the country as well, sustainable developments in some frontier areas need to be accomplished. So in this auspicious day, it is our solemn responsibility to ponder over our inputs towards upliftment of research and development of the nation, our very ideas for augmentation of fundamental knowledge base and developing solution 
to national problems. We should take oath towards fulfillment of the research needs of the institute as well as country by translating the novel ideas, thought into practice and actions, enabling us to set an example for the future generation to come and also look back on these days with a sense of pride and satisfaction. I'm extending sincere thanks and gratitude to all the students, academics, non-academic staff members of the Institute once again for their incessant support and assistance. I'd like to end with a quote of Albert Einstein, which attracted me very nicely and the best attraction I feel all the time, very nicely. A quote, a hundred times a day, I remind myself that my inner and outer life depends upon the labors of the men living and dead that I must exert myself in order to give in the same measures as I have received and am still receiving. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Bondapadhan. I now request our chairman, Professor Gautamar Desi Raju, to preside over the 83rd Acharjo J.C. Bose Memorial Lecture and kindly introduce Professor Ashutosh Sharma. Professor Desi Raju, sir. Dear friends, I am very happy <clears throat> to be with all of you this afternoon presiding over the Acharya J.C. Bose Memorial Lecture, which as the director has rightly pointed out, is one of the most important functions in our institute. I am especially happy that the speaker this afternoon <clears throat> is Professor Ashuto Sharma, the Institute Chair Professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. When we <clears throat> discussed possible speakers for this lecture, which would be the first one to be held in the physical mode after the pandemic. As usual, there was some discussion. And when the name of uh, Professor Sharma came up, I told the director that if Professor Sharma was speaking, I certainly wanted to preside over the function. And uh, it's a matter of regret, of course, that I am not with you here physically. I had really looked forward to being in Calcutta. Well, I'm actually there in a way. You see, I'm there in North Circular Road, looking at all of you from the main campus. So I'm not really that far away from the Institute. And uh, no, I'm very happy, Ashutosh, that you are <clears throat> giving the lecture here this afternoon. Incidentally, you know, welcome back to this side of the scientific community. You've been gone for too long. And uh, we all look forward to, you know, your contributions in Kanpur as a professor. Now, Professor Sharma has an extremely distinguished curriculum vitae. And I will not be exaggerating when I say that he is one of the top scientists of our country. I am not going to bore you with the details of the various awards and recognitions that he has received. 
but let me say the following three facts about his biodata that really struck me it's not very many people who get a phd and an honorary doctorate from the same university and i think professor sharma is one of the few people i know who has received this kind of a rare distinction his phd and honorary doctorate are from <coughs> suni buffalo and his research is highly interdisciplinary and in a broad sense i might say it has to do with distance scales in its widest possible ramification the second thing i noticed about his cv was that he has a very high h index with a rather lower number of overall citations now this clearly means that each and every one of his papers has been well cited and it means that he doesn't have too many papers that have received small numbers of citations and this again i think testifies to his i think careful choice of his research topics and the fact that he probably doesn't write papers unless he has something to say which is something that we need to see more of in this country he is also interested in a variety of subjects such as ancient history philosophy poetry and art and i think he does he does dabble in some of these things i wish we were to see more of this aspect because really ashutosh we have you have reached the stage when we need to see different facets of your personality now about today's lecture itself the abstract is highly provocative and uh, i do wish that he would take up some of the questions you know he says he is going to talk about the larger concerns of science now i want to know what these larger concerns are according to him because each one of us has some different ideas about what the larger concerns are i think please mute yourself i think there is some interference there is some interference in the speak then he is he is going to talk about everything that is not written in class now i want to know why these things are not written in class he is going to address it today you know i hear a echo somewhere you hear an echo do you hear it yeah please mute please mute him yeah i think now it's much better okay he says he is going to talk about everything that is not addressed in classrooms and labs now i want to know why these things are not addressed in classrooms and labs because i think our classrooms and labs on the whole are getting quite boring and there should be more of this kind of thing he says science and society now why is science related to society i mean acharya was talking about things like this and in fact he says that in his title itself the brave new world of science today is but the world of jc bose and cv raman this word but so what have we been doing in this one century between bose and raman and today why did we need a whole century to come back to the same point then he talks about nurturing diversity now diversity is very very important in our country because india is a very diverse country and i think i really want to know his ideas on how science and innovation 
will nurture diversity also in the Indian context. It is particularly important for all of us. I think director also hinted about this, that we have to do our work not only as scientists, but also as Indian scientists. He says, the speaker says he's going to argue for the fact that the challenges today are not so different from the life and world of Acharya. I could not agree more. I mean, Acharya was doing his work at a time when this country was struggling to find itself. I would say a century later, we too are struggling to find ourselves. And today we do not have to fear external enemies so much as the internal enemies. And I think science and scientists today must take a more positive and active part in refashioning and rebuilding our country. Please remember, faculty, all of you are very highly paid compared to the average Joe on the street. So the country really expects much more from all of you than it does from the average Joe on the street. Students, Please remember that you are the new India. I think what Professor Sharma is going to tell us, not only that science is fun, but that science can also be deadly serious. I think Acharya did his work both in the spirit of fun and in a spirit of seriousness. The last sentence of Professor Sharma's abstract contains a very scary words in parenthesis. He says, the progress is rushing even exponential. See, this even exponential is very scary to me because if it is moving exponentially, then we have to move double exponentially. And how on earth are we going to do all this? Because scientists, you see, we have to stay ahead of society, not behind. So the abstract uh, Sutosh was so tantalizing that I'm really looking forward to this lecture. And once again, in my formal capacity as chairman of the governing council here, I extend to you the heartiest welcome to the Bose Institute. And I would ask the audience to join me in giving the speaker a hearty round of applause. Professor Sharma, please. Today is, a, today is a very auspicious day. Uh, as you all know, it is uh, the birthday of uh, Acharya um, Vidhish Chandos. I am so delighted that uh, Professor Gautam J.C. Raju is with us, even though uh, that he was not feeling well, he has joined us virtually. And I am also so delighted that he had put in more effort to explain my abstract than I put in writing it. Uh, and that's totally fantastic. I think he has totally understood uh, the abstract uh, and has been able to explain much of it already. So that makes my task much easier. I'm very thankful uh, to Professor J.C. Raju as well as the director, um, uh, the, uh, Professor Uday Pondo uh, for inviting me here for this uh, very, very prestigious lecture, which has been going on for 83 years uninterrupted, I think perhaps the only time that this could not be held was in 2020, uh, from what I could tell from the list. Uh, so, so that it, it is indeed that A, it's an auspicious occasion, and B, that we will be talking about things here, as Professor J.C. has to explain. Uh, this is not so much about... Even my wallet. 
So that there is no interference. The receiver here can have to be on. The receiver here. So no, no, I think these should not be on. I mean, turn these off. There should be some way to turn these off. Okay. Yeah, because you would get this. Uh, <laughs> And the speaker. Okay, so what we want to talk about very, very quickly is that this is not a discussion about a particular branch of science or engineering or what have you. Uh, this is about the overarching concerns of doing science. Which means the way I explain it, this is about the architecture, this is about uh, the structure and the process of the science itself. So one could have science for process, but you also have a process for science. Now, the process for science is really independent of what kind of science I do. Now, in fact, I'm not even a scientist, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm a lowly chemical engineer, uh, which in the pecking order of science comes after, from below there. And I'm perfectly happy with it. So, the point, one of the points about the modern science and going into the future is that uh, this, this aspect about having a very fixed identity about what kind of scientist I am and taking it so, so seriously. They one cannot really uh, you know, come out of it and look at the problem holistically. So I would actually come to that in a moment and saying actually what puts us down is, is not that we don't understand science. Uh, it is not that we, we don't have intelligence and we don't have the training, uh, very, very, uh, very deep training if you work uh, that you receive. Uh, actually our weakness is, is our strength. Uh, 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 so and that's usually the case. If you were to look at the Roman Empire, uh, the reason it fell is because of its strength, it's not because of its weakness. And, and so let us look at some of these aspects. Uh, and as I pointed out that, of course, the abstract is very, very ambitious. And there is absolutely no way that one can actually do justice uh, to all this stuff which is in the abstract, uh, even though that Dr. Dave Graham said that we would discuss uh, some of these things. The idea is to just have the ball. rolling about the keyword, so each one of us can actually think about these things and say, look, that there is something beyond doing my own science, that there is something which is a little bit overarching uh, in that. And of course, we, we, we stand here under uh, this great banner uh, of uh, Acharya J.C. Bose, uh, as well as Sri Raman. And the reason I picked up these two people is because between them, uh, they uh, you know, uh, you know, they, they include a rather long uh, period. Yeah, whatever. Those sound boxes, that's And those sound boxes are working? Yes. And it says both there. Yes. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so what we want to do actually quickly uh, is, uh, is because if, 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 you know, if, if basically, or I can say the golden period of Indian science, and between the two of them, they were in some ways similar, in some ways they were different, but they covered a very long period uh, of Indian science there. So, uh, so what is it that they want to do? Uh, so, before we go further, let me recall that this is my fourth visit to um, the Bose Institute. And I fondly recall, actually, five years ago, uh, in fact, two of the presidents had visited the Bose Institute. And this one was on the, uh, the, the centenary uh, celebration of the Institute uh, back in 2017. It was a date, it was just yesterday. Uh, so, so those of you who are not on the Facebook, please get on there because then you know you, you don't have to remember any of this. And so as soon as I post this stuff, it shows me after five years, ten years, two years, whatever. Um, right. So that uh, this, this was very heartening, and then the building actually at that time when uh, when uh, uh, then President Mr. Pranam Mukherjee visited the campus, uh, I remember that there was a lot of optimism in the air. The building was not complete. Uh, and a whole lot of activities were going on uh, at that time. I'm so, so glad to see that everything has come together now uh, in a big way. Uh, you know, everybody has moved in, uh, infrastructure is looking good, uh, and so on. Okay, so what is it I want to do very quickly in this uh, discussion? Uh, the first aspect is what are the overarching challenges of science and technology? 
as well as what are the structures and processes. So as far as uh, you know, some of the futuristic or uh, the challenges which are coming at us at faster and faster rate. Uh, the first one, uh, the top one, I would say, the rise of intelligent machines. Uh, and uh, the second one would be sustainable development. Uh, the, the third challenge is uh, moving uh, from invention to innovation, which is not to say to, to, uh, uh, to discard invention and discovery, but to say how do we actually also bring in innovation in all of this. And the fourth one is related to inclusion, equity, and diversity. The second aspect here that we want to discuss very quickly are the strengths and weaknesses, especially in the context of India, uh, in our science, technology, innovation, education, all that concerns us, uh, the people to India. Now, what makes uh, science and technology work? I mean, one may think, look, what, what makes science and technology work is basically I'm an intelligent person, I've been trained, I got some good grades, I sit in a good lab with infrastructure, and I can do my science. No, so, so that's really necessary, but it's not sufficient. So we want to look at those aspects of science and technology, uh, which are beyond science and technology, if you would. And that, that's why you may call them the structure and processes of doing science, rather than the science itself uh, that comes out of it. Uh, okay, and so to do all of that, uh, what kind of new mind that would meet the challenges of the future is required and how this might be a little bit different from the way that we organize our science. Uh, okay, and finally, in the second part of the talk, which is how the world of science and technology today and indeed in the future approximates, it parallels uh, the world uh, of uh, the Eastern Bose and C. V. Raman, and what are the kind of, uh, kind of uh, uh, lessons that we could draw uh, from the history. Okay, so let's uh, quickly look at what is the good news uh, for India. Uh, India now is number three in number of scientific publications. Uh, you know, from uh, this is one NSF study, and as you look at Bible of Science or some of its purpose, it may be a little bit different. So anyhow, uh, this is very close to number three or four in the world in terms of the number of peer-reviewed scientific publications. Uh, just about eight years ago, it was uh, number eight or so. So there has been a very rapid climb in terms of number of publications. Uh, there is deep strength in R&D and the institutions such as this, uh, our central universities, ISERs, IITs, uh, a whole lot of R&D institutions. So there is a very deep strength there. Uh, even if it is a potential strength, even if it is not always realized, it's not on the surface, but certainly it is there. As the demography is on our side, uh, the median age of India today is perhaps 27 or you know, approximately that, uh, which means you know, when I go to a mall anywhere, I'm the oldest person over there. Uh, very, very difficult to find people who are uh, you know, on the other side of that age. Can you other side, Professor J.C. Raju said that he would be glad to see me on this side again. Actually, I was always on this side. There was no other side ever. Uh, okay, he says it's all the mind. So anyhow, so just to say that, uh, you know, uh, I'm totally comfortable with this kind of stuff. And uh, demography, human resources, that's the strength of India. Uh, the young people, it's not simply about the age, it is about what the age brings. So, what is it that the age brings? It brings energy, uh, even though a little bit less experience, but it's compensated by the energy, the raw thirst. The hunger, if you would, uh, if, if the age is then about taking risk. So that you would see more startups and so on. And certainly, I am not going to get you no know, start a startup, uh, but I would expect that people are in the 30s, 20s, and so on. And certainly, and certainly, roll up their sleeves and they can take risk and they can have startups and get into innovation business. Uh, so new enabling policies which have been going on for the last uh, decade or so. <coughs> Do see diversified markets. What that means is if it is successful in India for certain segment of people in the market, then it would find market somewhere else uh, as well globally. But, so of course that there are many strengths that we can build upon. So those are the foundations uh, to build on. But uh, what are the problems? Uh, the problems are, of course, that even though quantity is kind of sufficient, 
the quality is lacking. So no matter how you look at it, uh, I'm not saying you must look at quality only in a particular way, uh, but certainly the quality is a little bit away from the quantity. The relevance and direction of research uh, is often lacking, is often weak. And the reason is because the connect with the other stakeholders of science is not very strong. So the relevance and direction of research, where can it come from? It cannot come from vacuum. I mean, just sitting on my desk and thinking, look, what is it I should do? So often it comes from this great university, XYZ, it comes from my peer group, uh, which is sitting somewhere else. And I say, look, I mean, these are the guys who tell me what is the direction and relevance of my research. Uh, so that, uh, of course, that is one way to do it. Uh, but another preferred way to do it would be to find the right direction and relevance so regardless of what those great uh, you know, universities somewhere else are doing or not. Uh, so to have that particular confidence of the relevance. Of course, uh, the, the problem is with the research in terms of the whole lot of it being incremental rather than profound. Uh, a whole lot of it being business as usual rather than disruptive uh, that, uh, you know, that brings something new idea or something new product or what have you. Uh, it's often not India-centric uh, and the reason is that I don't really know what is happening in India as a scientist. Uh, this is true. I mean, this is not, you know, this, I'm not being cynical. Uh, it applies to me as well as it applies to any of you or anybody else uh, anywhere. Uh, it is often not innovative and connect uh, between industry uh, in between industry, between uh, industry, academia, startups, government, and all of that, NGOs, uh, is basically lacking, is very weak. So each one works in the silo. Now, that may not be a problem, but I'll tell you why that is a problem. Uh, okay, connects. And of course, education, as we already know, is like totally bereft of creativity, taking this independent critical thinking and the process of learning. Okay, this might seem like a harsh thing to say, but uh, believe you me that I have been teaching at a you know, top IIT, uh, and I have been a BTEC there, I have been teaching there for quarter century, uh, and five years of BTEC there as well. So I know pretty well as to what really goes on in the minds of the brightest, the so-called brightest of our people who can compete uh, in any tough exam, uh, the toughest exam globally. Okay. Um, so, uh, that's the reason we keep asking these questions. These are critical questions, you know, that people ask about Indian science. Uh, even though that there are no very good answers about these. You say, why one is a follower rather than a leader? Why is one this course? Why is one not connected to stakeholders of science and technology? Uh, why is one uh, usually very negative in doing our work? Uh, if, you know, I mean, I, I know so many of these. Yeah, yeah. That, everywhere in all the education institutions where people hang around for three to four hours a day and the only thing they do is gossip. But they say, nah, I'm sure that we got better things to do than to do that. So, so why is it that it comes very spontaneously to us uh, to say that, look, uh, you know, uh, hey, this is not working, my director is so bad, my you know, country, their support is I mean, there's no end to the story that you would hear. I can tell you so many horror stories that come out from this theme, and indeed any other themes that we are discussing here. And uh, most concrete stories, most concrete examples, but we don't have time to do that, uh, but I would be very happy to talk outside about anything that you pick up here and you would like to discuss more. Head there, uh, right, all the way. Uh, so we say, why there is translation, why there is innovation, lacking, why there is low self esteem. Uh, and then you would be saying, outside world, you know. Why they don't know the price of this size is so great, right? And you would often hear, of course, we are sitting here now in the institute where everything is good. We are doing PhD and we have published more papers. And that's how, I mean, you say, okay, my work is done, I've done all that. And now, on to finding a postdoctoral work, right? Okay. So, it's like a career belt that goes from PhD to MSc to PhD to postdoc, looking for a job and whatever. Postdoc is default. Uh, I mean, it's not uh, a great deal of planning that goes into it. But anyhow, whatever. So, so what is it? I mean, you know, you ask uh, your average scientist about all these questions. And the most likely answer would be, hey, you know, if I had the same funding as a Nobel laureate, then I also get double funding. <laughs> they all boys talk to, you know, saying, look, this is, I have not got money, right? 
but we have to critically examine whether this is indeed the right answer or there is something more to it. So what is something more to it is what I want to get it. Of course, one needs money, one needs infrastructure, one needs good quality human resources, one needs all that, one needs just this camper, one needs another camper, everything is needed. Absolutely. But is that sufficient or is it something that is lacking in our approach uh, to doing science? Let us look at some of the challenges of the future. And these challenges of the future, even though I have given them some names, the real challenge is this, that there is a great convergence of different streams of knowledge going in the future. So first, what did we do? Uh, in the last 100 years, we have fragmented knowledge. Now, I must come back and say, look, I have to reassemble these bits and pieces of knowledge uh, to solve the problem again. And we call it multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, out of disciplinary, transdisciplinary, no disciplinary, I don't know what, no discipline, whatever, right? Uh, okay, but but the point is, this is all a huge misunderstanding. It's a huge misunderstanding because, because we first created disciplines and now we realize that these disciplines are not sufficient to solve problems. Uh, if you are going to work with one discipline at a time. So therefore, uh, actually being interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary is the natural state of things. They are not superimposed on disciplines that we have already created. Uh, but having created, we have no other way of solving this and saying, look, now we want to be multidisciplinary. Uh, right? Whatever it is. Uh, so, uh, if this is like a uh, rise of intelligent machines, uh, which you can say is uh, doing manual, cognitive, and even creative work. Uh, uh, please read up, uh, if you see in an international uh, art, uh, art uh, exhibition. The number one painting was created by an AI tool. Uh, of course, that AI has been the world chess champion since the 90s. And, and now, uh, I mean, even the computer, which is driven by AI, uh, can beat all the other computers which have the sum total knowledge of chess as generated by grandmasters of the entire human history. Right? In two hours, your AI computer driven, uh, can learn the, 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 the game of chess or indeed any of these games, and it can beat the accumulated wisdom of the entire humankind. This uh, revolution is happening now, and this is going to impact the way we do science, uh, which basically means that uh, integration, synthesis, conversion. In this particular case, it is the convergence of cyber and physical, uh, digital and cyber on one hand, and physical on the other, which means materials, machines, mechanics, mechanics on one hand, one hand, and this. Uh, so it's a, it's a convergence of communication, computing, perception uh, through sensors, autonomous action through AI, the decision making, and autonomous action through actuators. So it basically is what you call industry 4.0. Uh, or, uh, you know, the essential idea is that this is going to impact every kind of science, every kind of scientist, and not only that, every activity that we undertake in life. Uh, which means learning, work, governance, experience, entertainment, health, judiciary, commerce, medicine, privacy, what have you, everything. Right? Now, each one of these aspects actually require about two hours worth of discussion. So, while I'm throwing some keywords over here as to how AI actually impacts, in fact, how does communication and computing impact each of these aspects, it will be very easy to see. Uh, so what I'm saying is, uh, for the future, the future doesn't much care about people who call themselves one kind of scientist. Or say, look, I am just, I'm a green chemist, I'm a red chemist, I'm a, I'm a left chemist, right chemist, I'm physical chemist, uh, what have you. All of that is very good. That actually was done in order to do an identity. All of these disciplines have been created to give an identity, so the person will find a job. Uh, in a particular industry. Uh, okay, having served that particular um, uh, person, and now if you were to go beyond that, then obviously that all of this actually makes no sense, and the future can be one bit uh, you know, part about that particular approach, uh, if you like. Uh, of course, that ESP has launched the three major missions in response to the challenge of intelligent machines and R&D. And of course, what I want to point out is that this is not only for computer scientists. 
So every kind of scientist, every kind of science, especially when it's science and complexity in it, uh, will get infected. Uh, so you know, I mean, uh, when you, for example, like one of the editors of an ACH journal called Applied Materials and Interfaces, I handle more and more papers in which uh, AI plus materials uh, play a big role. Uh, you know, so we ourselves are doing one project uh, where we say what kind of battery architecture and composition would be needed, but without actually doing modeling uh, on the battery or uh, without doing experiments. So where you have a whole lot of data. I mean, of course, thousands of papers are out there. You have all kinds of data. So based on that, you should be able to make actually good guess about what is it uh, that, uh, you know, that, that would give a good battery performance. In fact, when you know battery performance, I just remember one little story. Uh, the story. You see, those of you who work in electrochemical storage, for example, battery and supercapacitor. Anyway, yeah, then I have to yell more and more and bring this just right in my coat. Let me get it a little bit closer. Can you hear me now? Over there? Okay. Um, so it's like this, you know, when I was talking about profound versus incremental. There are thousands of papers which are related to making anode uh, for the battery or super capacitor or okay. Now these, of course, there are a whole lot of permutation combinations. There are so many different kinds of carbon, CNT, graphene, blah, blah, blah. All right? And there are so many of these different kinds of nanoparticles. Uh, you can grab them, you can put them, you can do thick chemistry, you can do whatever hell you want. Right? There are thousands of papers. But all of them show similar performance. In fact, this was very interesting. Uh, that there was a paper published in one of the top journals of Nano, called ACS Nano, and what they did is they took graphene and they put the bird droppings on it and they tested that and it performs as well as any other material. Okay, so now what I'm saying is why, you know, I can spend my entire life uh, making different compositions and different permutation combinations for the anodes and cathodes. In the end, actually, it makes not an iota of of course, it makes a, a, in a limited sense, makes a difference about my career. Because if I don't publish half a dozen papers, then nobody will actually recruit me. Now, the problem there is actually not with me. The problem is there with the system. Your system is so stupid that they believe that there should be six or ten papers, no matter what the quality of those papers are. So, therefore, everybody gets into this red race. And, you know, no, no matter how fast one runs, one is still red. Uh, you know, that is part of the next race. Okay. Uh, the second overarching challenge, which involves all of science and technology and all of uh, the stuff that we want to do uh, in terms of convergence of sciences, uh, as you know, is sustainable development. So basically, we have 17 sustainable development goals, uh, and no matter what kind of science we do, we need to look up to see where my science fits in these sustainable development goals. If I have not done that, I don't know what science I'm going to do. Okay, okay. You, you know, I mean, this may look a little bit extreme, but this is so. In order to relate my science to what is actually required out there, uh, of course, uh, you know, sustainable sustainable. Do I see to be working on and pick it up? Right? So, uh, sustainable development. Yeah, it seems to be working. I, I need to hold it closer. So, sustainable development actually is an oxymoron. Uh, just like uh, what we said about, um, you know, being interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. Uh, sustainable development is an oxymoron because. Our concept of development uh, through a particular kind of economics, which was a turn of the century economics, uh, said that look, development simply means it's equal, it's equal to consumption or level of consumption. So, which means if I had three cars and if I don't had two more, there would be no further development. Uh, or there would be more number of people consuming, or per capita consumption is more. Uh, that's the only sense of development that we have inherited in the modern uh, technological industrial society. 
on the other hand, sustainability is another uh, concept, and obviously they are pulling in different directions. Uh, so in order to be able to do this, this requires something beyond science and technology. And so all of these overarching challenges that I've talked about here are not simply challenges of science and technology, but they are challenges that have dimensions which are much higher than doing science in the lab. And I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, so, so let me conclude this by saying, look, when we talk about sustainable development, we, uh, or we talk about any science leading to product or process, there are two aspects which are very important. One of them is nexus. I cannot talk about, for example, agriculture without talking about water and vice versa. And in fact, I cannot talk about anything really without talking about environment and without talking about health, uh, for example. So these are nexus. And therefore, the other thing is life cycle analysis. Now, I like, you know, he said, this guy, I don't know who he is, but I like what he said. He said, I used to think the top environmental problems of biodiversity loss, uh, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. The, I thought 30 years of good science, we could address those problems. But I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and equity. And to deal with this, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And uh, we scientists don't know how to do that. But what he's saying about scientists is actually true for every section of society. Is that the reason is very simple. Nobody is in control. So essentially, everybody, everybody gets pushed in a little narrow channel uh, without really uh, you know, offering any resistance in, or, or new part in that particular challenge. Uh, let me look at the third challenge, which is the challenge of process. And to understand very clearly how invention is different from innovation. So about 12 years ago, I was part of the CSIR committee, which wanted to start a new award, Shanti Saru Patara Award, in innovation. And after three meetings of this committee, people could not decide on what innovation means and in fact, how to measure it, right? And since then, I've been thinking about this problem. And now I'm convinced that to quantify innovation is in fact easier than to quantify invention. Okay, so then let's have a very quick uh, go at it to see what is invention, what is innovation, what is the difference between the two, and how do we move it to innovate, the innovation ecosystem. So invention, if you would, uh, uh, you know, you think of this simplest with a black box, uh, invention, it requires uh, money to flow in and knowledge flows out. Okay, so the invention and discovery is what we do. That's, you know, in universities, uh, in R&D institutions. So essentially, infrastructure is needed, human resources are needed, money is needed in order to produce and transmit knowledge. Innovation, in fact, is mathematically orthogonal to that. So innovation is another black box in which uh, knowledge flows in and money flows out. Okay, so is the invention and innovation working together completes the circle of knowledge. Uh, so if we only talk about invention, essentially we'll run out of all resources, but we would have a lot of knowledge. But that knowledge, unless it is converted back into resources, uh, it would basically come to a stop, uh, the whole cycle. So now I will actually, with the help of this concept, explain to you what is wrong with Indian science? What is wrong with Indian science is not the ecosystem of invention. It is the ecosystem of innovation. In other words, while we can produce knowledge, that, that producing that knowledge may not have the direction and relevance in order to convert it back into new opportunities. So, so you see, unless you understand this very easy basic point, we would be passing up the wrong tree. And you know, people would be saying, hey, what is wrong with Indian science? I don't see uh, how it is actually helping society and so on, or industry and so on. Because the stakeholders of innovation and invention and the interface between them are very different. Okay, so it, it is about generating knowledge, the other is about consuming that knowledge. So it's like a hydrogen bond. If I had donated a proton, but there is no proton acceptor, then there would be no bond. So this is exactly like the ecosystem of invention and innovation working together. Now, uh, of course, I sometimes illustrate uh, the problem solving aspect in innovation uh, as uh, the three Hindi words. 
uh, which is I uh, call them Jugaad, Dhanda, and Panga. Now, Jugaad, of course, we all know it is you know solving some problem by uh, by hook or by hook, uh, which is not an optimal solution. Uh, it is not a scalable solution. It is not a globally acceptable solution. So therefore, we have to move away uh, from Jugaad business. And the second is of course Dhanda, and Dhanda is a very stable, continuous way of doing things. 80% uh, of what happens to the society is basically Thanda. Uh, I think I was saying, look, okay, um, uh, if I can get 5% more budget uh, you know, for the institute next year, uh, then this is business as usual. Okay, so this is Thanda. Uh, the third aspect, which is Thanda, is a disruptive uh, change or, or disruptive uh, way of solving a problem which replaces the old problem totally. Uh, okay, uh, we go to solve. And the fourth challenge, as was pointed out, uh, is inclusion, diversity, uh, equity, and so on. Now, you know, often people think about, okay, what is all this uh, diversity? What does it mean? Um, why should we have diversity? Shouldn't we be going for optimal solution uh, and not diversity? Uh, of course, I, you know, I've not seen any bicycle work on a single wheel, uh, except in a circus. Uh, and so it is clear that we need a balance. Uh, society and, and a balance of perspectives. Think of it like this, why do we find diversity in nature? Uh, so nature absolutely does not like optimality. Uh, or maybe biologists may disagree with me, I don't know. But as far as uh, I have thought about it, that there are many different ways of doing the same function in nature. And they are not all optimal. So it is basically not optimality, but diversity which is value. Now, if, you know, if you think about it, if all of us were optimal copies of each other, they've all been optimized for certain function. Uh, that is very good, uh, except that when the first new virus comes, and it kills one of us, it will kill all of us together on the same day. Uh, so while uh, being optimal is very good, uh, it's very good if we know uh, that the circumstances are not changing, uh, that, the, that the world remains static, uh, and that we have been optimized uh, to function in that particular space. So, okay, about the, the new mind, what is it, what are the changes and directions that we want to take uh, looking at these overarching challenges, looking at the future which is coming at us at faster and faster rate. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's like, look, when we talk about uh, changes in technology being exponential, uh, since technology can change exponentially, this is what is called lights and shadows of technology. So, you know, this is one thing you always pay attention to. Of course, the same people who are making that technology never pay attention to shadows. They always focus on the light of their technology, and this is why every technology has some weird failure in it. Uh, in the sufficiently long term, sufficiently long term, it will all change, no matter what this technology is, because uh, we have another technology to fix the shadow of the first technology. And so on and so forth. Anyhow, um, so you say, look, uh, the technology that are arriving now are exponential, but the human brain and society at large, it changes uh, linearly with a small slope. So the difference between where our mind is versus where the technology is, that, that difference will keep on growing <laughs> as the future comes. Uh, and, and so this is true because we are just resistant to change. That's not the way society is set up. <coughs> okay, I uh, mean, I have too much time to go into that. Essentially, saying, look, there is a shift from tool centric to problem centric approach. Tool centric simply means that I know certain things, maybe I know perturbation theory, maybe I know uh, something I know, and I, I know this tool, and I'm going to search for my problem. That will fit that tool. Uh, other way to do that would be to define a problem which is significant. It is important. Maybe it takes 20 years, maybe it takes all of my life to work on it. Maybe it requires a team of people to work on it. Maybe it takes a discipline. But the problem is at the center. The tools are secondary. Uh, are there. So it, it is very hard to do, of course. Uh, that goes without saying. Uh, it often brings to my mind a little story I had in high school, uh, which is uh, this fellow called Mullah Nasruti, who was like a beaver of Middle East. And Mullah Nasruddin, he lost a bunch of keys and he was searching for it for about four hours. Uh, then his uh, friend came and joined him. 
He said, Mullah, if you will lose your bunch of keys, he said, I lost them there. I lost them there. He said, why are you sweating there? He said, because they won't like there. Uh, so it is about, uh, you know, we often do things that that are easy for us to do rather than things that need to be done. Uh, and so that is the hardest part of the uh, science of the future. Okay, let, let me uh, come very quickly to the point about what makes science and technology work or not. The first aspect that we all familiar with is the ecosystem of invention. And this includes education, this includes doing PhD, doing postdoc, uh, being a faculty member, being a scientist, uh, working in an R&D institution, working in a university. All of that is related to invention and uh, the transmitting knowledge and creating knowledge ecosystem. Uh, in, in order to, it may have strengths, it may have weaknesses. The strengths and weaknesses of the invention ecosystem are entirely different from the strengths and weaknesses of innovation ecosystem, which comes next. So innovation ecosystem, which is, uh, consumes the knowledge and produces, transforms knowledge into something else, something more material, something uh, socio-economic opportunities, uh, so to say. Uh, the third aspect uh, is about policies, rules, laws, structures, processes, <laughs> Uh, and we often actually underestimate the value of policies for making science work for us. I will perhaps later on give you a very clear example of what happens when we have all the science in the world uh, that we may need to solve the problem, but the policy is not there and it would fail. Uh, in, in fact, if I don't take time later on to talk about it, just think about a, a, a product that we use every day of science, which is, you know, if you are coming to this campus or going anywhere else, you you have a map, right? Nowadays, nobody drives without a map. No service is delivered without a map. No infrastructure can be produced without a map. But why is it there is no Indian map? Have you thought about it? Is it because of lack of science? Is it because we don't have science and technology to make a map? Why is it that I'm using an alien map? In fact, my own data is being monetized by a company which is not Indian. So just think about it. I don't know if I have time to talk about it later, but it is just one, uh, you know, everyday common example of how science and technology that I do, or the research that I do, everything I do may not actually work for me. Uh, in fact, it so happens that the maps I work with now, they all been produced in Bangalore. They all been produced by Indian IT people, and the data that they are representing is our data. Yeah. But you don't make money out of it. You know, it's not India that makes money out of it. So, you know, I mean, just think about it. And perhaps if there was time, I'll tell you the solution to that particular problem. And this is to bring into the play uh, the policy dimension. What is possible and what is not possible to make science work for us. And that is also part of our innovation ecosystem. Now, uh, then, connect, of course. Uh, and most important thing. Is the cultural and behavioral aspects that we don't talk about, uh, like I just said, like in the classroom, we don't talk about it during PhD or before that or after that, and we not talk about it at all. But in fact, what differentiates a small nation ABC from a big nation CBD uh, is actually that cultural aspect. It is not my training, it is not my IQ, it is not my preparation in science and technology. What differentiates uh, uh, one community from other in being successful in science and technology and its fruits basically depends largely on these factors which are beyond doing science in a lab. Uh, so these factors are cultural and behavioral. These are about uh, the will of society, how society at large behaves. It is also about the policies and rules and all that stuff. So I could give you an example. Uh, we are talking about Atmanibharta, two science and technology, even Atmanibharta in science and technology. Let's look at a you know, very uh, special aspect of Atmanibharta, which means being self-sufficient. Now, this self-sufficiency, of course, depends on invention and innovation ecosystems, but it also depends on uh, Atma Vishwas, which is uh, you know, self-confidence. Uh, you know, I know a whole lot of people, a whole lot of cultures, where you say, look, I may be stupid, 
But you know, I have the confidence to say, look, I would go out and solve the dead problem. Right? Here I see there's the opposite. So what I see is the top guy who, who is steering the top exam. But you know, they look, they go go do this, they say, oh, I'm just a teacher. Right? Or some such thing. Which is like totally, you know, it has nothing to do with actually what IQ and training that I have received. It is just a question of the confidence that has been drummed into me by my parents, by teachers, by mentors, and whatever. That's why this is about Atma Vishwas. It's also about Atma Samar. So Atma Samar is not just self respect. It is respecting also others because if I don't have something, I can't do it to others. So this, this is so, so clear to me that why people are so negative. They are so negative because they have no confidence in themselves. And they, you know, all this going here, there, it's, you know, saying, I don't really have any goal in my life. And if I can drink four cups of tea, that's sufficient. And I can do a lot of gossip. I can say, why this guy is not working well and so on. Or what, you know, that is not working well. Uh, then, you know, everything is just survival and survival. But anyhow, these are some of the aspects. Now, coming to policies. The new policies are coming up, and I think uh, you know it would be a very big misunderstanding if we say that if I'm doing PhD or if I'm a scientist, I don't need to know about policies. Uh, I would I would urge all of you to read the draft policies as they come up, uh, as well as policies as they are published. I don't know how many of you may have read a uh, policy on education. Now, of course, one can be totally cynical. Okay, one can be totally cynical. You know, I, I will see a lot of people who will be laughing here. No problem about that. Then you can be totally cynical and say, hey, what the hell is following? You know, I know all this stuff that go up in this world, right? Uh, but actually, we don't. Okay, so unless I can understand what is going on, I cannot translate that vision in my own practice. So, uh, for example, national education policy. I don't know how many of you know what is actually special about it. Of course, it can remain with service. Anything we have not understood, anything we have not internalized, anything I have not worked to work on, will actually remain a disturbance. And that's what happens with most of the policies. The failure of a policy is not in the policy. It is actually in our empathy uh, to any of these aspects. And I say, look, I have published four papers. Why do you have any good policy? Right? It is actually the will of the society which is molding uh, to many people uh, working on it. Uh, uh, so, so this example I was giving you about surveying and mapping. Uh, in DSP, we made a new policy uh, regarding surveying and mapping. The old policy for 150 years from British times was that you cannot do any surveying and mapping without approvals. These approvals take eight months uh, from um, from uh, defense, from home, from uh, intelligence bureau, from whatever, right? Now if you think about it, look, technology has moved on. Uh, you see that you have maps of everything available, so there is nothing you can hide. Okay, but the only thing is, because you cannot uh, do survey and mapping, no Indian citizen or entity could do survey and mapping without these approvals. Therefore, you don't have your own maps. Very simple. Okay, on the other hand, somebody who is operating a uh, uh, satellite, and he is not asking for approval, he may be breaking the law. Okay, maybe okay. breaking the law, but who cares? Right? So you, you basically make the map and you sell it. All right? But the only thing you do by uh, having regulated uh, that sector is to prevent your own people using science and technology for this purpose. Right? So you cannot actually, you know, if you have a terrorist attack, for example, uh, you but cannot prevent that by having a policy of saying, look, you need approvals for surveying and mapping. Because the enemy doesn't care about your rules. Who cares about those rules and the law-abiding citizens and businesses? So therefore, this year you, you may have the drone, uh, you may have lidar, you may have all the software, but you would not be able to make a map. So but anyhow, to cut the story short, to give the example of policy, how it makes innovation ecosystem work for you, in fact, science and technology work for you. I mean, this policy. Uh, so basically, it says, look, you don't need any approval for surveying and mapping. Unless that area is restricted for physical access by a competent authority. So, therefore, you can separate uh, the, uh, the security aspects from developmental aspects. And, and what is the offshoot of that? 
I guarantee you in five years, you would have much better Indian maps than the maps that you are using today. The overall impact on the economy of two kinds of policy would be order of tens of lakhs of crores. So no matter how much science and technology I did, uh, but that kind of impact on innovation and economy is not possible unless there was an enabling uh, policy uh, that was present. Uh, let, let me uh, switch to another aspect of science and technology, which is you know often not talked about. Uh, look, this is something I read in Psychology 101. Uh, Psychology was back in 1977. I remember this is called Maslow's Pyramid of Hierarchical Needs. Now, if you look at the base of this pyramid, uh, you would see that these are called deficiency needs. These are needs, physiological needs, and roti kapha and kapha. These are safety needs, needs for belonging and love, and needs for esteem and so on. They are deficiency needs. And you see that all the science and technology which gets translated actually addresses these particular needs, which are called deficiency needs. Uh, you know, as you satisfy more deficiency needs of people, and society, then you move up and you move into what is called growth needs, uh, which are cognitive needs, aesthetic needs, self actualization, and transcendence. Whatever that means. They are not coming from some Indian sadhu. Okay, this, this is, you know, the people would be happier if you are coming from there. And they are very scientific. But you know, you can see it in your own life, uh, right? And if you don't, if you are much younger now, you would really see it in 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, from now. So now, interesting thing about this pyramid of hierarchical needs is that why science and technology of the external world can address the deficiency needs this is not very good at addressing the needs of growth. In fact, they may be inversely correlated to each other. In other words, when you have well, five cars, uh, okay, it's not necessary, there's going to increase my happiness. Uh, in fact, maybe other than now, there may be no correlation at all. Okay, so an interesting aspect about this is that why uh, we need to do science and technology, we also have to do a whole lot of other things in order to do, to do good science and technology. In fact, we have to address the higher needs of achievement, of satisfaction. Those needs are based on cultural aspect, psychological aspect, aspect and sociological aspect rather than what happens in the lab. Uh, right, so if, if I had that under control, then I would be able to work better on deficiency needs. But working on deficiency needs, other way around is not true. Working on deficiency needs does not mean that I would be able to address the growth needs. Where by addressing growth needs, I would be able to better address uh, deficiency needs. Uh, so, I've been Okay, uh, so now the next part of this talk is like I said, let's go revisit the world of JC Bose and CP Rama. And see, okay, what is it that these guys were thinking? What is it that they were doing? What is it that they were saying? And how does it correlate between quality science in today's world? Okay, so I would just let them speak uh, for themselves. We already know uh, that he was a polymath. In other words, that he was a good scientist, both uh, you know, in terms of disruptively new ideas, uh, you know, profound uh, thinking, and also multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. The difference between multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, uh, you know, you look at Google Guru, you want to understand what the difference is, and you need both of this, multi and inter. Uh, in fact, also trans is a different thing to work, and you know all of that. Uh, he also excelled in, uh, you know, institution building, uh, was a good administrator, uh, and basically a man who was very driven uh, with energy, with purpose, and had a holistic understanding uh, of science. Uh, and, and of course, it was much easier than then uh, because science was not so compartmentalized. Uh, there's some stuff that I uh, visited over time. Okay, let's, let's hear from J.C. Bose. I said uh, he was very impressed by the character of uh, Karn in Mahabharat. He said, like that of my boyhood hero Karna, my life has been ever going to come back and must be to the last. It is not for men to complain of circumstances, but bravely to accept to confront and to dominate them. Now look at the balance of holistic thinking. Balance of right and left or outside and in. 
uh, which is how admirable is the Western method of submitting all query to Scopus experiment to verification. That procedure has gone hand in hand with the GIMP for introspection, which is my Eastern heritage. Together, they have enabled me to center the silences of natural realms long and communicated. So, so this is the hallmark of a genius in terms of having a balance. In not saying, look, only the external technology, only the internal technology. In fact, I would say, if we master the internal technology, which is reflected in culture, psychology, and sociology, then we would be able to master the external technology much better. The scientific method, sitting at the, you see, uh, now the, the method that we make use of often, we say the Orient, we say, sit at the feet of masters. But in uh, the Western culture, they say, stand on the shoulders of giants. Right? So there seems to be some contradiction between these two methods. However, there is no contradiction between these methods. We need to do both of these. So when what I, I, I need to understand what exists, the existing knowledge, I need to sit at the feet of masters, but when I need to do new discovery, I have to be more critical and climb up on his shoulders. And so he says, by continuous achievement alone, we can justify our great ancestors. We do not honor our ancestors by the false claim that they are omniscient and had nothing more to learn. They would be our worst enemy who would wish us to live only on the glories of the past and die off from the faith of earth which she has succeeded. So this is about, you see, balance. It is about saying, look, knowledge is never static. No matter what it was, that we need to understand it and build upon it, uh, the best of traditions. Uh, about Atma Vishwas and Atma Saman, nothing can be more vulgar or more untrue than ignorant assertion that the world owes its progress of knowledge to any particular race. The whole world is interdependent and a constant stream of thought to all ages and this the common heritage of mankind. It is a realization of this mutual interdependence that has kept the mighty fabric bound together and showed a continuity of permanence of civilization. Let's look at the, the so called spiritual wisdom of connecting with the deep tradition. They who behold the world in all the changing manifoldness of the universe, unto them belongs the eternal truth, unto them else, unto them else. This I know who is saying. But this is not religious. Okay, this is actually very scientific. And if you wanted to actually dwell upon this a little bit, you would see as to how this would enhance our scientific processes and understanding. The power of concept and idea. The true lab is in the mind. We are behind illusions. We uncover the laws of truth. You see, so often time, even today's work, people often think about if I have a billion dollars, then I can actually be on top of the world. This is not true. Everybody else who has a billion dollars will actually be at the same space. Uh, so today one wins the race, not simply by having a billion dollars, a lot of people have billion dollars, but by the power of ideas. Okay, and this is something that we have forgotten a little bit, but we have not emphasized it enough in the race to say, look, uh, if I just had, maybe you know, if I had 10 million dollars, uh, okay, if I had 10 million dollars, I know from my personal experience, all I will do is manage 10 million dollars. We are not going to have a system uh, for a good management of my position. Okay, um, about art and science, about holistic thinking and balance in life, out of box thinking, about risk taking. Uh, the poet is intimate with two, while the scientist approaches awkwardly. Come someday to my left and see the unequivocal testimony of the Tesco uh, family. Right, so all of these uh, things, you know, they really they look. That the poet in, uh, in a scientist is as important as the scientist. Uh, and so we cannot ignore that particular aspect because this is where the creative juices uh, they go from there. Disruptive ideas, unconventional thinking, uh, the telltale charts of my testograph are evidence for the most skeptical, that plants have a sensitive nervous system, very emotional life, and countless appropriate responses to still life. So this would have been, you know, totally unacceptable for scientists of that age. It is such a, uh, it is such a revolutionary idea, as it were. Uh, but you know, most people would shy away uh, for putting up an idea of that magnitude because they think, hey, people are going to make fun of me. Yeah. Uh, reason optimism, 
and justifiable pride now is about capacity to endure through infinite transformation must be innate in that mighty civilization which has seen the intellectual culture of the Nile Valley of Assyria and Red Lord Beck and Wayne and, and disappear and which today gazes in the future with the same invincible faith with which it met the past. Uh, you see, so it is it's not about the kind of, uh, you know, it's about reason optimism. It is by uh, evidence, we are saying, look, that there is something here uh, that we can build upon. Um, importance of science communication, of course, you know that he was a great science communicator, this he goes himself, and he says, I have sought permanently to associate the advancement of knowledge with the widest possible civic and public diffusion of it, and this is without any academic limitations. Henceforth, to all races and languages, to both men and women alike, and power and power. So, these are you know, glimpses of basically how the mind of JC goes, was thinking about things, about being positive, with conviction, born, and understanding. But the past shall be reborn in a yet nobler future. We stand here today and resume what's more. So, that by the efforts of our life and our unshaken faith in the future, we may all help to build a greater India yet to be. This is not about nationalism. Okay, sometimes you know, it has become a dirty word. So, you know, whether you call it a spiritual, if you call it national, whatever, right? It becomes a little, you know, people are conditioned to think negatively, some of us are, think negatively about these things. But JSC goes and knows his problem. He knows the hangovers. Now, fortunately, in those days, uh, you know, all these concepts were not so well developed about the left, right, center, up and down. Uh, so, okay, uh, then coming to the last part, the talk, I may have, uh, you know, gone uh, beyond the time, uh, a little bit or more. Uh, but hey, uh, we, we hear from uh, C.D. Raman about these aspects, which are about, not about a particular science, but about doing of science. I see what makes it possible to do good policy science. Uh, so that is what we are focusing on. And these aspects to repeat again are psycho, psychological aspects, sociological aspects, cultural aspects. So basically, that is what makes us or not make us do things uh, which are right. Uh, okay. So, uh, of course, we know about uh, C.D. Raman. I don't need to get into it. Let, let's just look at a couple of things that he said. So, it's about taking risks, about taking responsibility. Uh, I am the master of my failure. If I never fail, how will I ever learn? Uh, and this is actually so true today because this whole revolution about startups, about innovation, it totally rides on this sentiment. Uh, so, if, you know, so of course, our education system has not allowed us to take any risk. Of course, failure was never considered any good. I mean, there is not an option at all. So, therefore, uh, that those kind of qualities are not in uh, you know, that will lead in us. Uh, learning from failures, you can't always choose who comes into your life, but you can learn what lesson they teach you. Power of ideas again, the essence of science is independent thinking, hard work and not equipment. When I got my Nobel Prize, I just spent hardly 200 rupees on my equipment. Now, of course, science have changed. So I'm not saying, you know, buy 200 rupee argument uh, without any modification. But essential idea, that look, it's not only the rupees that matter, but uh, the critical, powerful thinking, the power of ideas uh, is so important. Uh, confidence is the key. We have, I think, developed an inferiority complex. I think what is needed in India today is the destruction of that liquid district. Uh, okay, so I mean, in fact, I continue to see it uh, today. So I don't know if things have changed a lot in 100 years uh, since, uh, you know, uh, the Acharya actually were doing science. Um, so, now how do we know about the inferiority complex? I mean, one thing actually is because, uh, you know, I keep following whatever things are doing. Uh, so I don't have the confidence to say, look, uh, because, uh, you know, NIT, BIT, CIT, IIT, right? Somebody else is the great university in doing this. So therefore, I should also do this, right? Uh, at the same time, uh, please observe this very closely. When you have these so-called international conferences, and you see the uh, people who turn up, uh, who have a little different color of skin, okay, you see how people behave. And you would convince yourself, in fact, uh, that, you know, that, I mean, these people get mocked. 
maybe it's because people are looking for the post doctoral opportunities or whatever you, I don't know, the reason because they are more. And all people are thinking that they are wiser and my professor is not so wise. So I would go find the solution to my problem because we can encourage them. Right? And so nothing would be you know, more stupid than that. Uh, in fact, uh, if you were to go in these countries, uh, then you look at color risk and say, hey, India, not me, really is very smart. <laughs> right? Uh, so, you know, so, so this is very important because unless you have that confidence, you will not be able to do good science. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, democratization of science, uh, which is about also power of mother science. And it came to me as a little bit of surprise that C. Raman had actually come out about it. Uh, and indeed, anybody who has grown up uh, in a school, in a society, uh, which was not relying only on English, uh, clearly, uh, and that is much of India. Uh, when you look at 85%, 90% of India, uh, they will suddenly can grow up with English as a mother tongue. They say, look, we must teach science in the mother tongue. Otherwise, science will become a hydro activity. It will not be an activity which all people get body today. I feel it's unnatural and immoral to try to teach science to children in the foreign language. They will know facts, but they will resist it. This is so true from my own experience. Uh, okay, and I am sure we can cite our own experience with each one of us and say, look, uh, of course, that there is an uh, inverse argument. They want to say, look, if I didn't know English, how would I do global science? How would I be a part of all these networks, uh, the global science, which rise on English and so on? But if you just look at uh, South Korea, look at Japan, look at Germany, look at France, how do they do it? So obviously, that one can make an argument about it. Uh, and uh, and uh, there is a, a very good way of doing it. Self respect and self confidence, we need a spirit of victory, a spirit that we carry us to our rightful place under the sun, a spirit which can recognize that we, as inheritors of a proud civilization, are entitled to our rightful place on this planet. With that indomitable spirit will arise, nothing can hold us from achieving our rightful destiny. Confidence and courage of this evident is the key. You see? So here is very interesting, he says all the instruments known to European science are essentially non-musical. It can only be tolerated in open air music. Or in large orchestras where little wise more or less take to the You, you see, that just requires such a big deal of confidence in, 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 in your understanding. So he is making a scientific assertion. You know, making a you know, cultural assertion. You know, making you not saying, look, I don't like Europeans. It's not about that, right? It may not even be politically correct, but he is making a statement which is based on evidence and he has the confidence to be able to say that uh, very openly. So my take home uh, from the life and science of these two polymers uh, of uh, doing effective science in the India, uh, connecting the dots, creativity, multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinary, a uh, power of ideas in a world full of constraints of infrastructure, connectivity, and even foreign rule. They were able to do that basically under the kind of constraints that we cannot even think about today. Uh, I mean, not even a fraction of those. Even in fact, when I look at uh, two generations before me, since so I started my career doing independent science sometime around 88 uh, or 1980. Right, do I have to make generation before that, or one and a half generation before that? The constraints were so huge. I mean, I, I don't know how anybody could have actually done anything. If you want to go to a conference abroad, if you, if you need uh, approvals, that may take eight months. What I do, there's no dollars, there's nothing, right? But the so point is that yes, those constraints are there. And I have heard a lot of people who join with me. They say, how can you do science here? You cannot do any quality work here. There are all these constraints are there. They look compare with MIT. To that, I only had one answer. He said, you cannot compare with anybody. Uh, if you think that you should be in MIT, please go there. Okay, but if you are going to stay here, if you have constraints, then you are going to do the best uh, within those constraints. And you are going to come out on top. Okay, of course, nobody believes and listens to what I say. But in any case, uh, this is very clear that you cannot complain. I mean, if, you are, if I am in this place or that place, I have, if I have an option to go somewhere else, I should take that option. On the other hand, if I don't have an option, 
I should tell you something. Right? So either way to complain if you have negative emotions associated with it, I will put a waste of time and energy. And I have seen so many good minds in India who are totally wrong because of it. Uh, you know, I mean, what a waste of mind we, we think about. I have seen 10 pointers from IIT uh, who have just given up and said, I cannot do good science here because I got constraints. Right? Okay, so it's about innovating, even new instruments, uh, you know, the whatever is needed, uh, confidence, the saving, and uh, this. They were also not shy in choosing our traditional wisdom and the current. Uh, things without abandoning the roots or being ashamed of it. Cultural ease of Atma Nirvata, Atma Vishwa, Samar, Atma Chintan, keen observers of nature, the whole of nature inspired science there, builders of institutions and uh, excellence in scientific administration, appropriate mix of Jugaad, Dhanda, and Panga, democratization of science and also communicating science, and holistic personality. Uh, that was able to integrate all of this in order to deliver. Uh, so this is my two bit about how the world of uh, JC Bose and Sri Nama in fact was not very different from the world of science in which we operate today. And to conclude this, I would just again emphasize that science is not only what happens in the lab, it happens in the lab, but what makes it possible to happen? What makes for effective science? actually are all the reasons which are beyond the lab, uh, which may be in my mentor, uh, it may be my colleagues, it may be uh, the culture that my institution invites, uh, and in fact the society at large. Uh, and so by doing all of that, I'm sure that we can, uh, this is one dimension of doing science which is often neglected. Um, I apologize for going beyond the time uh, which was allotted, I think. And thank you very much for your patience. We can have two questions, one and a half minutes. this question. Shall we give you the handheld mic? Mm, this is also a handheld. Yeah, <laughs> it's transmission. It's transmission. Yeah, it's some problem. problem. Right. <coughs> so, with, sir, with your permission, can we I have, can stand here and yeah, can have the audience ask a few questions? Yes, oh. I don't think you can see this. So, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. With your permission, is it okay if we have a few questions? Although, if, if, the, if the speaker wants it, because uh, in lectures of this kind, we normally do not take questions. But if the speaker would like to take a few questions, I, I'm I'm totally open to discussing. No problem about questions. Okay, but let's see that it doesn't go too extended. We'll take a couple of questions. Yeah, a couple of questions. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for the great lecture. Just one quick comment. I think there is an Indian company that is mapping data now. So that's why we... Yeah, yeah. The, it was made possible because of this policy. And I may also say that, you know, because of this policy, now there is a new scheme called Swamitva. Swamitva, basically, you know that in rural areas, uh, people do not have ownership certificate for their land. Now, this is all being digitally mapped with 10 centimeter accuracy. And within the next uh, seven to ten years, all rural people, uh, they are going to have their ownership certificates. This is bringing about a revolution. Now, what is a revolution? Revolution is that you can monetize your land. Once you have the ownership certificate, you can go to bank and take loan. Otherwise, you have to go to the you know money lender, right? Half the litigation which is going on in courts is because people don't have ownership certificate. So, what I'm trying to say by this is not because of the lack of science and technology we could not do it is because the lack of policy which means to deregulate that particular sector now what's going to happen is there's going to be a whole lot of flow of money from urban areas to rural areas right because of the bank you know giving loans uh, against your money your land holdings the impact through services through infrastructure 
and through monetization of land is the impact is just so tremendous that you cannot even think about it and all of that simply because you would make a policy that would let your science and technology work for you what was that the question so now indeed this is true in fact all the map my india and all these companies uh, they they came up and they said they never expected that this uh, you know will be totally deregulated this particular sector they have been uh, clamoring for it for about 3 decades saying please do little bit little bit but you see there is no point doing little bit it has to be disruptive it has to be one clean sweep and you say okay go from 100 to 0 totally deregulated I don't think there are any. If there are no other questions from the audience, oh, there's one more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. You talked about the invention cycle when you use the resource to generate knowledge, and innovation cycle when you use your knowledge to generate uh, resource resources. So, do you think that in Indian scenario now? Is it only emphasize this innovation cycle rather than the other one? No, no, I'm not saying. I'm saying that one has to strengthen the interface between invention and innovation cycle. On one hand, see, you 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 have to strengthen whatever is lacking. Okay, so while there are weaknesses also in invention ecosystem, those weaknesses are not as big as the weaknesses of the interface between invention and innovation ecosystems. so you know when we keep saying are bhai all problems will get solved if i only pump little bit more money in research is not going to solve the reason is because weakness is not there see i'll i'll tell you how the weakness is not there when the covid 19 hit us uh, we had no ppes we had no n95 masks no diagnostics no um, uh, ventilators uh, no vaccines right but they could all come up within few months uh, to the best of global standards which basically means that if invention and innovation ecosystems were working together our scientists can deliver it is not the the weakness of creating knowledge it is a weakness of creating relevant knowledge which can be absorbed and it is the absorption process of that knowledge uh, which is weak right so so therefore when you think about policies for science technology and think about where to throw money what to strengthen right it would be totally barking up the wrong tree you were saying look uh, of course one needs more money in the invention ecosystem no doubt about it but having said that uh, the the major weakness may not in fact exist there so it's not our science and scientists who are weak right it, it is that translational aspect uh, which is weak which is also beyond the invention ecosystem Yeah. Okay. So I stop there. Thank Maybe you. Maybe you can interact after. Yeah, of course I can interact right. after. You. So, Professor Desi Raju, <coughs> would you like to sum up? Yeah. Which one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Come down. We will request you to come up. Ah, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Why don't we ask the speaker to sit down and enjoy a glass of water or something? I should just wait until they take a seat. So, so, Professor Desi Raju, thank you, sir, for uh, presiding over today's uh, events. We also thank Professor Sharma for his lucid, motivating, and insightful lecture. Thank you, sir, for making us, especially the younger generation, aware of the mindset and outlook needed to practice science. Your words will certainly have a lasting impact. So I now request Professor Bondopadhyay to kindly felicitate Professor Sharma.
Uh, if I may quickly say, you know, I keep telling people not to give shawls, but give T-shirts. That would be innovative. And also not to wrap up in non-sustainable packing, all this stuff. And I look, what the book, is just show the book instead of wrapping it up and then opening it again. Right? So these are innovations that can be introduced uh, in all our meetings and conferences. It is now time for the chairman's address. Professor Gautam R. Desi Raju has made seminal contributions to the field of crystal engineering. He has also developed the study of weak hydrogen bonds, establishing this interaction firmly in the repertoire of chemists and biologists. He has more than 450 research publications and is one of the most highly cited authors with a very high age index. He was president of the International Union of Crystallography between 2011 and 2014. Professor Desi Raju has authored multiple books on crystal engineering. Besides his scientific contributions, he has also authored several commentaries in the popular press on education and how science should be practiced. In his recently released book, Bharat India 2.0, he has meticulously analyzed the governance structure of our country and laid out his vision for the future of India. Professor Desi Raju has received several prestigious international awards, such as the Alexander Humboldt, von Humboldt Krotzung Spears, the Twas Award in Chemistry, and the ISA Medal for Sciences from the University of Bologna, and the Van der Waals Prize 2023 from ICNI Strasbourg. Sir, I request you to kindly deliver your address. Thank you very much. It's uh, Professor Sharma who gave the lecture today and not me. So, and I didn't say half as much about his CV as you have said about mine. But uh, the Ashutos, thank you so much for this lecture, which really made me think about uh, so many other aspects. Professor Sharma, you see, has put in a sort of a kaleidoscope today so many different ideas that we as thinking people, thinking scientists, faculty and students, what this country needs today and I am sure Ashutos will agree with me. Is more people indulging in quality thought. See, the idea that there is this disconnect between innovation and invention. I mean, all of you know that I work in hydrogen bonds, so I was mildly amused when he said something about donors and acceptors. But you see, there is no hydrogen atom. The, he said correctly, there is no bond. In fact, I will add. Can you please switch off the, switch off the volume on the Bose Institute? There is an echo, please. Please switch it off. A, if there is no hydrogen atom between the donor and the acceptor, then it actually becomes a repulsive contact. And I think uh, the so-called misdirected innovation probably is the root cause of many of our ills. Professor Sharma has 
as I said, given a wide ranging panorama, both from his experience as a scientist and his brief experience as an administrator. See, we should all realize that this country of ours is at a particular inflection point. Many of the mistakes, and there were many, committed between 1947 and 2014 are only beginning to be unraveled now. These are big mistakes, small mistakes, sins of omission, sins of commission. And the task of administration itself is a formidable one. Where do we scientists fit in all this? I feel very sincerely as somebody who has worked in the Indian scientific system for now 43 years and someone who has spent 66 of his 70 years exclusively in this country. I feel that we scientists have failed our country because we were not quick enough to pick up on the crisis. When Albert Einstein wrote the letter to President Roosevelt, which led to the beginning of the Manhattan Project, you see the scientists were ahead of society. They were not scared. Ashutosh talks about scientists not needing to be politically correct. Raman, he says, absolutely correct. What is this political correctness? Politicians come and go. CPM came and went. TMC will come and go. Somebody else will come and somebody else will go. What happens to this glorious city called Kolkata, which is situated in a glorious province called Bengal. Everybody has forgotten about that. See, we scientists have a moral responsibility because we have been trained in very special ways, believe it or not. And we have to use this very special training. Only we can bring about solutions to some problems. This word disruption, I was so happy to see in his lecture. As some of you know, I am involved in the planning, active planning of this S20 vertical of G20. And I successfully argued for this disruptive word as the overall theme of S20. And it has come into the public domain only a few days ago, so I will repeat it. And I'm sure Ashutosh will be happy with the wording of this overall theme of S20. It's called Disruptive Science for Innovative and Sustainable Development. Disruptive Science for innovative and sustainable development. The innovation is there. The invention is implicitly there because the word development is there. I strongly feel that all good science is disruptive science. If you take the discovery of the Mosbauer effect, the unraveling of the DNA structure, the discovery of the radio by Acharya. These were all examples of disruption. This dhanda approach 
will never lead to big advances in science. That is meant for bureaucrats. It is meant for pen pushers. It is meant for people who are scared to upset the cart. It is meant for politically correct people. Scientists have for too long in India been happy to take their 50 lakh, 60 lakh projects, 1 crore projects, sit in their labs and say, I was trained to do this work by my postdoc supervisor and that's what I'm going to do from cradle to grave. If you do that, you are a disgrace to this country which, because this country doesn't have that much money to indulge you in simply doing what your postdoc supervisor taught you 100 years ago. And people like Acharya and Sir C.V. Raman would give you a kick in the backside if they knew that this is what was going on in Indian science today. Because they didn't do this. Acharya was a rich man's son and he was sent to the school where poor children studied. Whereas subordinates of his father went to a higher level school. So you see already he had the advantage of upbringing that he could feel and emote with the people. And he rightly points out his Western and Eastern, both must come together. The Anglosphere must meet the Bharatiya. And yes, Bharat is not a bad word. It is our word. And we want, see, Vigyan Mandir, he called it. The Bharatiya Vigyan Mandir. And like an act of, we do science like an act of worship. I can tell you personally speaking, I am not a great person to visit temples. In fact, I rarely go to temples. And when people ask me, I would always say my lab is my temple. It's the end of the matter. I should have talked about so many things today. I mean, I was so happy to see this cultural thing, social responsibility. Why do we have this defeatist spirit? Yes. As I said in my earlier remarks, the internal enemies are very bad. Please go and read Sitaram Goel. Christianism as opposed to Christianity. Islamism as opposed to Islam, Macaulayism and Marxism. And these four put together continue to have a debilitating effect on our country. And this kind of attitude, with these kinds of attitudes, we can never, not only not do good science or do things properly, but the country will never go forward. So if your aim in life is to see that this country goes backward, then everybody, all of us should keep doing whatever we've been doing for all these years. There is a revolution going on now. Ashutosh's talk was disruptive, it was candid. And he also speaks from the viewpoint of somebody who has seen the inner workings of science administration. I think he conveyed to us the great difficulty and the fact that finally people have realized that this country has problems. Let me also continue and talk about a few things which are very important to see the revolution that Ashutosh wants. These factors are actually non-scientific and non-economic. You know, he said many times, money is the least to do with all this. Our thinking, mental thinking is not okay. Today we are in a scientific revolution 
an education revolution. But then certain things are a must. We need judiciary and law enforcement reform. We need administrative reform. We need defense reform. We need a civilizational reworking. Integrating Bharat's reawakening with respect to its lost identity. Germans behave like Germans. Americans behave like Americans. English people behave like English people. Indians behave like nothing. We are a lost lot who don't know who we are. Slowly we are begun to realize that something was wrong. I am now talking especially to the younger members of the audience. Because this country is yours. The future is yours. The speaker talked about our slavish attitude to people of a certain skin color. This business of rushing abroad for postdocs, this business of rushing to America to just take H-1B visas, perpetual postdocs, all these are not the routes to leading a happy life. Deep and urgent constitutional changes of the type that need a constituent assembly are called for. And there needs to be a much more sympathy and understanding from both sides on the relationship between the center and the states. Unless all these non-scientific, non-economic things take place in this country and there is some evidence that the process is beginning. We cannot do good science. Science can no longer be done in silos. Just feeling that I have written three or four papers in Jax or Angevante or Fizrev letters. That is not life. It's not life for us in India today. You know, I'll tell you a small story. When Israel was created, you know, they said that started off with a population of 1 million or something. They called it the story of the 7th million. Because 6 million had perished in Europe in the Holocaust. So they said each person in Israel has to do the work of 7 people. One for himself or herself. And 6 times the amount of work for the people who died in Europe. Our situation in India is not that bad. But I think each of us has to work for many people today. Please remember that you have been educated at great cost by a rather poor country. I can afford to say this because I had a PhD from one of the best universities in America. I had a job and a green card, which I gave up at the age of 26 to come back to India without a job. So I can afford to talk like this. Do not go and stay away in foreign countries. That era is over. Those countries are collapsing. Before long, there will be four empires in the world. America, Russia, China and India. No other country will matter. We are going to become a 6 to 7 trillion economy by 2028-29. Many things that look like problems now will not be problems. I urge scientists to listen to the speaker very carefully. And if there is a recording of this speech, because he has given us a lot of facts. And to understand the first part of the talk, the quotations of Acharya and Professor C.V. Raman will do. Because essentially he was paraphrasing that. And these two great souls said many of these things. And in the end, let me say that, and now I finally speak as chairman of your governing council. 
the bose institute has been through very difficult times in the last few years who hasn't with the covid pandemic i would like to really congratulate all of you the administration the director the faculty the students the non teaching staff for having made this successful move to the unified campus during the time of the pandemic this was extraordinary and considering the number of uh, health tragedies in other campuses we have not had in the bose institute too many serious incidents of this and this is something that i have always noted with some satisfaction other things remain to get done we have the problem of it is not uh, multidisciplinary but multi campus so how we synergize and harness our seven campuses including this one where i'm speaking to you from in north circular road all these places have to be brought up quickly and here as it was money is required here this we can't do without money you see bose has got a very nice combination of high energy physics biology agriculture climate change these are all precisely the topics for example that something like s20 is going to take up so the what you are concentrating on is quite modernistic what you need and what i hope you can take from today's lecture firstly feel proud of yourselves as bharatiyas this process of decolonization must be carried out very effectively by all of you do not look back too much to the past he told us something about standing on the shoulders and sitting at the feet yes you can do all these things from a distance but finally you will only be measured you know both asidosh and i got our phd's from american universities and one of the things you learn in america is that you are rewarded not for what you know but for what you do karma yoga that's what gita teaches us and i think that is what you should try to do in the very difficult times ahead i am not being unduly pessimistic i'm just being realistic but i'll end with an optimal note the many things that speaker talked about today gave me the feeling that all the bits and pieces are there for a modern india which is powered by high quality science and technology it's just that these things have to come together at one point in time in his speech he used the word synthesis and not just analysis It's absolutely correct we've had too much of analysis in this country perhaps you people in bengal analyze too much and synthesize not enough too much analysis is bad i think what we need is a synthesis to bring various bits and pieces together and i can now speak confidently as a chemist because chemistry is a wonderful balance between analysis and synthesis no other subject does it so well the time for synthesis has come dear friends and in today's 106th jc boss memorial lecture the first speaker of whom was gurudev i think speaker has carried on this glorious tradition i wish him well in his future endeavors i am also glad that he is able to come to our institute and give us this most inspirational lecture this afternoon thank you very much professor sharma
Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I now turn the podium over to Professor Shanjay Ghosh, Dean. You are muted, please. You are muted. Can you hear me, sir? No? So, because of COVID situation and also because of the fact that we have been trying to move to this campus uh, for some time, uh, there were a lot of disruption and there were less communication between the scientists and the students, and we have been trying to adding something so that all the faculties, all the students can come together. So this time we have been able to do that. On 28th and 29th, we arranged a, a symposium for all our students, uh, recent trades in uh, natural science, where all the scholars participated. And uh, all the faculties also participated as judges to understand, to, to interact with them, also decide on their quality of uh, presentation, both oral as well as poster. The students have really participated in a big way and they have worked really, really hard to, to, to make their presentation as, and most of them were really excellent. So we, as a token of our appreciation, we have decided to, uh, to, to judge, you know, decide few oral and poster presentation as the excellent presentation. So uh, I request uh, Professor Ashutosh Sharma to come here and also I will speak the name of the students. So if you can come here and to receive the, uh, our appreciation, token of appreciation from uh, Professor Sharma. So in oral presentation, we uh, there were both biological and uh, physical science section separate. Uh, can you talk here? You can sit here. <laughs> okay. So, uh, in in uh, oral presentation, as I said, there are two uh, groups. One is the biological sciences, and the other one is physical and environmental sciences. In uh, physical sciences, there are two persons uh, where just excellent uh, presenter. One is. Uh, Mr. Shayok Chatterjee, I think, who is here. Shayok works in experimental high energy physics. Other person in physical sciences is Sheikh Mustaq Ali. Mustaq is not here. Uh, he is working on uh, cosmological lithium problem. And uh, Dhruva, do you want to collect the book on his behalf? He is working with uh, Dhruva, Professor Dhruva Gupta. Yeah. 
in uh, biological sciences, the, uh, we have uh, two, again two pastoral presenters. Uh, what is Mr. Uh, Shuboti Poti? Are we here? Yeah. This is why I always request you guys to sit in the front. Whatever is left in the hand will be off. Better collect it now. Yeah. And Mr. Kostka of Bhakto. Rest of the people can clap, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know. Thank you. Okay, uh, we, other than oral, we had poster presentations and almost 87 posters were there. So out of all 87 posters, we are uh, giving our appreciation to five persons. First is Ms. Moshumi Bhattacharya. Are you there? Moshumi. No? Which I don't know which lab. I don't know what lab. You don't know. Okay. So you tell uh, your topic. I, I... <laughs> okay. Shoika Dev. Topic that will be. Thank you. Next, Obi Modok. Obi, are you there? Anunna Mukherjee. Yes, what what I don't picture you was here. Everybody is sitting in the back. Sitting in the back. Yeah, you see, it's traveling so much distance. See, <laughs> because then they they take the book and sneak out. <laughs> Finally, Sonal Church Day. Sonal, are you there? Huh? She is the green room. Okay. So, okay. So, okay. Ah, there is Sonal. Okay, so that completes this um, uh, presentation uh, formalities. So let's thank Professor Sharma once again. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, I, I have one more uh, pleasant job to do here. That's the vote of thanks. 
uh, that's that's a pleasant job as well as the most difficult job because uh, uh, to organize this kind of function, especially when it started 26 and keeps on continuing till 30, you really need uh, help and cooperation from each and every person of this institute. And the first time we had this um, meeting of our, this foundation committee, I, I was really pleasantly surprised that not only staff, faculties, um, students, everybody turned up. I mean, OK, little bit prodding was needed, a uh, few phone calls, but finally everybody came. And they were really eager to do their job. So uh, we could uh, finally sort of you know, collect everybody and take the job distribution. But to, for the to this pro program to become a successful, we have to first thank our uh, our uh, guest of uh, chief guest as and, and the, to the speaker, Professor Ashutosh Sharma, for his excellent talk. Sir, thank you for taking time from your you uh, know in your piece from your busy schedule and come here and deliver this lecture. So I request all of you to give a big hand to him. Uh, our uh, chairman of our session today and governing council chairman, Professor Tishi Raju. Uh, uh, I hope, sir, you are okay, you are doing well, and it's nice to see you again here. So please give him a big hand for his presence and his words of wisdom. I must also thank our director, Professor Udar Bandhupatai. He has been there with all of us again and again and, and supported us in all our endeavors. Uh, so, give him a thank to uh, hand as well. We we had uh, support from, as I said, every every part of the institute uh, administration. Uh, many people from administrations they came out, and came up and arranged for different things. One of the very important things of this whole thing was food. And uh, as a representative of that, Tapun took the Professor Tapun Dr. took the, all the responsibilities. So please give him a big hand. Uh, I would request also all of you to also give a big hand to all the people who, who arranged for the students, you know, Shayo from students Shayok and some of the people standing in, in sitting in the front row, uh, some other students as well as uh, the staff, Rajipal, Antipankar and others. All of them worked hard and, and of course all, too, all of us worked hard, not only to arrange this, but also to arrange the, arrange the display outside and uh, make it look good. So please uh, congratulate them with a big clap to all of them. Uh, finally, of course, uh, all this program cannot happen if, as I said, if all the students are not participating, all the students are not cooperating. So one thing I, I, we must do together, I mean, all of us together to give a big hand to our scholars. It uh, does a lot to, to make this program a success. So I think I have covered most of the people, uh, or, or rather all the people who have helped us. If I left anyone, uh, I'm sorry. But so if, in case I have left someone, so give a big hand for the people whom I have left. Okay. So I will end my vote of thanks here. So thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to our speaker, Professor Sharma. And thanks to our uh, chairperson, Professor Tishi Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of today's function. I request this August assembly to kindly rise for the national anthem. Bharat Bhagavidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravira Utkara Banga Binda Himachal Yamuna Ganga Utchara Jaladita Ranga 
तब शुभ नामे जागे तब शुभ आशीष मांगे गाहे तब जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे Thank you all for coming, and we hope that you will join us again next year. Please join us for high tea in the dining room. Thank you. Oh, one one quick announcement: for there will be a cultural program which will start at in about forty five minutes. Please be here. You know our students have made a special effort for this cultural program. I'm sure everybody will enjoy this. Please fill up the hall and have a good time. And the certificates, those of you who have won prizes uh, today, uh, the certificate uh, either day after tomorrow or a little later, please get in touch with Professor Shupriyo Dash, who will give you the certificates. All right, thank you. I'm going to go to the